forgot to record an intro with Issa for this so here it is welcome to D-Listers of History a podcast about interesting people you probably didn't learn about in school I'm Fega and I'm Issa okay back to what we actually recorded we are we're live yay except not live but not not live but live recording my my notes just erase themselves again not erase that's that's more oh, dramatic that's not good that would be that would be an exciting one where i'd have to just remember everything off the top of my head yeah it would be like 10 minutes max the entire episode. it would be fun it would be fun let's but think, yeah but we can uh let's do a let's do a whole thing yeah i was i was thinking about this today because i uh you know this already isa but i am officially back as a tour guide in the city of philadelphia <gasps> yay uh things didn't work out in my old job yep but my job that i was at before that was super excited to have me back awesome. and so doing a lot of cool stuff and uh thinking about tour guide education and social yeah. studies education and stuff and in tour guide cool. education i always tell tour guides you have three to five minutes to tell a story mm-hmm. and so that's been actually a challenge with this podcast for me is I was afraid that I didn't know how to tell a story that was more than five minutes long. I, I totally hear you. I am currently, like, I am currently in that phase that I've heard a lot of people, be, other people be in, where I'm just trying to, like, move into making YouTube videos, and it's really daunting because I'm used to telling stories, again, like, you're like, like I'm used to telling things in a really short period of time, like, one and a half minute to three minutes, but because... I, but I want to tell these big, long, complicated stories right. on YouTube. Um, but I'm just, like, nervous to start doing it. <laughs> yeah, it's nerve-wracking. Yeah. And especially, like, the the company I work for is a double-decker bus company. Mm-hmm. And telling a story on the top of a bus, you don't always even get five minutes. Yeah. If you get five minutes, that's, like, leisurely. That's a long story. You get two minutes yeah. most of the time, if that. Because mm-hmm. sometimes... If if your driver hits a green light, they're going through. Yep. They don't care that you're right next to Ben Franklin's grave. Well, not they don't care. They care. But, like, they, they can't hold up traffic. Right. You know. And so you've got to tell everybody about Ben Franklin in two minutes instead of four or whatever. And that's It's a serious a skill. And the thing is, once you start doing that a lot, then you get in the habit of doing it. Which is not a bad thing. It's a very, very, it's a good skill to have that a lot of academics, for example, do not have to hone. That you, that we as, I don't know, content creators, tour guides, public educators have to find the shortest possible way and the clearest possible way of telling as many people as we can about a historical subject. Oh yeah, and actually this weirdly sort of brings us into who we're talking about today because the book I read about him there's not a lot of books about this guy his name's Tunis Campbell okay and the book is called Freedom Shore Tunis Campbell and the Georgia Freedmen by Russell Duncan okay and it's an interesting book it's an old book and I say that because there's a few moments where there's some language that's used where I went oh boy oh lord and I looked at the date when it was published and said were they allowed to say that then that doesn't seem like that long ago wait what was the date it was published that's a really good question. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> it's been a while since I read it. Mm-hmm. It's on my Goodreads. 1986. 1986. So it's Got the it. The same age that I am. And there's yeah. some language used there where I was like, ooh, I don't think that was acceptable in 1986. <laughs> Maybe we had moved on by then. Yeah. And the book is good as far as like information and so forth, but I definitely wouldn't. It's. It shows its age. Let's put it that got way. It. Not, got it. Not got just, it. Not just. And also, it also, also, this is clearly Russell Duncan's like PhD thesis. 
Yeah. And when you read these books that are based on people's PhD theses, theses uh-huh. they are like 90% of the time super dense. Yeah. Yeah. I That makes sense. So. <laughs> because they do not have to be. They also do not have to be brief. Yeah. That makes sense. In fact, in the social sciences, sometimes you are, what do you call it? You are given like kudos if you are not brief <laughs> yes i think there's a i think there's a we have a problem there i don't think that things need to be as long as they are no in general or is it things, dense books are too long make the books shorter is that a thing is that a book a, a hill i want to die on actually i'm not sure say what you need to say if you have a book yes. say what you need to say i'm i'm i take that back yeah i'm gonna I think, totally reverse i think that's the way to say it is, is say what you need to say but you don't need somebody else to help you decide <laughs> what you need to say. There's also a reason to have footnotes. I love footnotes. I love footnotes. If it's, if it's a little out of bounds, you don't have to do the whole thing. You can just make a footnote. And speaking of length, these are definitely the longest notes I've ever written. So I'm going to okay. try. <laughs> let's do it. Because not, we, let's do it. <laughs> I'm going to try not to make this three hours long. But he did okay, so great. many things. So He Tunis, did so many things. Tunis Campbell was born April 1st, 1812 in Middlebrook, New Jersey. Okay. He was one of 10 children, which I'm always amazed when I read these <laughs> things. I'm like, that is so many people, so many children. It's a lot of people in one so house. So many people in one house. Yeah. And people's houses were smaller then. Like, my goodness. He was the son of a blacksmith. And he was, he was black, mm-hmm. which is important yep. to this entire story. He caught the attention of a white friend of the family, and they were impressed with him, and so they sent him to, they paid to send him to this Episcopal boarding school in Babylon, New York, which is on Long Island. And he was the only black student there. Okay. So this is pertinent to his life because he learned at a very early age how to move effectively in white society. Mm, mm-hmm. He said that the principal and the teachers were very kind, which might imply that other people were not. Uh-huh. But we don't know that for sure. sure. But knowing the time, you know, it probably wasn't great. Uh, when he was 18, he was invited on a mission trip to Liberia. Okay. And I'm sure you know the story of Liberia, but in case any people in in our in our studio yeah. audience are not familiar with Liberia, Liberia was this like back part of this back to Africa movement yeah. that was started by white people. So, you know. <laughs> So Henry, it was weird. Henry Clay in 1816 said, hey, we have all these like racial problems in the United States. You know what would fix that is, you know, the problem is we white people, we stole all these black people from Africa and brought them over here. So why yeah. don't we just send them back? And yeah. that's not how that works. Yeah. Yeah. But that's like that's where Liberia came from. Uh, it, was Amer- it was an American colony. Very strange. Very interesting. Yes. So he was invited to go on a mission trip there. And then he changed his mind about the whole Back to Africa movement uh-huh. and decided it was bad. Uh-huh. Which, agree, sir. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so he didn't go. And he got really involved with speaking out against colonization and slavery. Got it. One of the quotes that he said, which I really like, is that he swore to, quote, never leave this country until every slave was free on American soil nice. unless I went to secure their liberation. End quote. Nice. Yeah, he's a cool dude. Yeah. I'm uh, glad. I'm I'm glad that we can just like I'm glad we have a cool dude that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he's, and he's, I, I he don't seems, think yeah. I have a bait and switch for you. Okay, later. cool. Uh, I'm I'm always waiting for the bait and switch. Sometimes. I'm always waiting for them to be a cult leader. <laughs> like in a not cool kind of cult. Like in a cult that's like mostly fine, but also like, you know, this is a lot. <laughs> um <laughs> I mean, it's been a while since I wrote these notes, but I don't think there's a bait and switch in there. <laughs> okay. All right. Because like, you, you heard my, the hesitation in my tone. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a cool guy. All right. Cool. Let's learn about I've, this cool dude. I've trained you well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so he was uh, involved in the Methodist church. He moved in with his parents after schooling in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Mm-hmm. Began preaching and all that good stuff. Uh, he became a very popular speaker at abolitionist rallies, so cool. he was good at it. Yeah. And he helped found a lot of black churches and schools around the New York City and Central and North Jersey area. Okay. 
So because he was doing all this stuff, this is a young man at this point, he was invited to the Colored National Convention, 1853. Now I'm going to make a note here. Throughout this, there are moments, in fact, I was going to say this when I said the name of the book and I got distracted. Yes. There's a lot of language here that was the accepted language of the time yeah. that we no longer use. So when I'm quoting something, I'm, I'm going to quote it correctly because yeah. it doesn't make sense to me. Maybe I am, I am happy to hear other people's opinions on this, but I figure if I'm referencing a specific organization. Yes, I have looked this up. You can say, yeah, if it's a specific organization, especially one that's working towards somebody's, towards toward liberation, generally it is accepted to say yeah. whatever they call themselves. But I'm always, on, on this language stuff, this is something I care about a lot. Yeah, and of course. I, I, I am always open to people's opinions on the matter, especially people who are from the communities that we're speaking about. So the term freedman, for example, was considered quote unquote acceptable for a very long time. I don't know if it's officially unacceptable, but I don't think it's a very good word because it. it defines somebody by their in free or enslaved status, like their whole personhood yeah. around that. Yeah. Um, again, very, very open to people's opinions on the matter. I don't use that word. Yeah. Of course. Okay. Of yeah. course. So, he was part of the Colored National Convention in 1853. And a big, his, his big push while he was there was both denouncing colonization, like being against the whole Liberian project, and also to remove references to race from materials it, that the convention was creating. Uh -huh. Which sounds backwards, I think, to a lot of us today. Mm. But he was, at this point in time, a little naive. Uh-huh. And he was an idealist. Yeah. And in his mind, if there were references to race in the documentation, it might make radical whites think they couldn't get involved. Interesting. So that so was this was concern. in the documentation for the association he was a part of? Yeah, so the, it was stuff that the convention put out as official, like this is what we've decided at this convention. Okay. Interesting, yeah. 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 And this is not the last time he deals with that. How he ma how he's making his money through all this like abolitionist speaking and so forth is something near and dear to my heart, and that is hospitality. He nice. worked in a variety of hotels in New York City and Boston okay. as okay. the principal waiter. Oh, cool! And he even wrote a book about hospitality called "Hotel Keepers, Head Waiters, and Housekeepers Guide." And in it, he said, order is heaven's first law. It becomes our duty to aim at if we cannot attain it in all things. Yeah. Hospitality, by the way, a little celebrated art form. An art form yeah. not celebrated enough, in my opinion. Oh, for sure. I mean, obviously, I'm, tourism isn't technically, well, it depends on who you talk to. There are parts of tourism that are hospitality. The place where I tend to live isn't usually considered hospitality, but we are very hospitality adjacent. Yeah. I am just interested in I'm interested in trades and workers <laughs> and working and how that can be an art form I'm interested in how that you know how did that uh interact with his speaking life well it it interacted maybe I mean it I don't know that it interacted with his speaking life it definitely interacted with his life later his uh -huh. organizing work cool cool Sweet. so 1861 there's a little event going on then called the American Civil War. Might have heard of it. Tough time. Sorry, yeah. that's downplaying it. That's downplaying it. It was really bad. It was oh, really it was, bad. It was not a good time. But he wanted to join the Union Army, but he couldn't because he was black. Mm -hmm. And he also then, when the Emancipation Proclamation, which I'm skipping ahead two years, the Emancipation Proclamation came out in January of 1863, and he presented, he, he saw his opportunity to be involved mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. And so he presented a plan to the government to educate and uplift freed people of the South. And the president ignored it. <laughs> okay. Because, I mean, to be fair, I'm sure the president gets lots of proposals about lots of things. I am sure. That was a particularly good one. Um, yes. But I'm sure that uh, that he got that from a lot of, he was getting that from a, a bunch of people who were like, hey, this is This, this is, is my opinion on how we should do this. Well, luckily for Campbell, 
he had been doing his networking and he had a friend who was able to intercede on his behalf and so he got a job the secretary of war who is edward stanton commissioned campbell to report to general rufus saxton general rufus saxton was in charge of confiscating abandoned plantations and providing for the formerly enslaved people wow on those plantations at the time, they called, if you look at the actual documentation, they call them quote unquote contrabands. Uh huh. Which obviously has problems around acknowledging people's humanity, but it's also an interesting story how that came about. Major General Benjamin Butler was in, you know, the South fighting the war. Uh-huh. And three formerly enslaved people came to him looking for shelter. Uh huh. Their frame, names were Frank Baker, Shepard Mallory, and James Towsend. Uh huh. And he refused to return them to their, you know, the people that enslaved yeah. them. Yeah. And he was a lawyer, so he uh-huh. found a piece of the law that if he basically he said, "Look, if you're going to see these people, these human beings, as property, therefore we are at war." And so these people then, if they're property, are contraband. Oh, interesting. And I don't have to give them back. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So it's one of those things huh. that obviously it's it's not good. Right. <laughs> this is bad. Right. However, it's th- these are the little steps that exist yep. before we get to where we ought to be. Yep. Okay. So that I just... I've always found that story interesting. That is really interesting and kind of fucked up. Um, yeah. But, you know, whatever gets people free also. Right. So that's... Was life okay for them where they were going? I don't actually know. It's been too long since I heard this story. Got it. I didn't get that story from the book. I just... It's just a thing I know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I did look up those guys' names. So clearly I looked it up somewhere. I don't know. I wrote these a while ago. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I hear you. I hear you. So... In the late summer of 1863, Campbell went to Campbell. I'm going to say his name 14 different ways. Campbell. Campbell. (laughs) Combo. Yeah, sure. One of those. All of them. Nice. Went to Port Royal, South Carolina. And he paid his own way down there and brought his own money to support himself. All right. So he may have been commissioned by the United States government, but he was not being compensated for that work. So he goes down there and he gets a little bit of a little bit of a, a culture shock. And where's wait, sorry. Can you what state is he in? Yes. He was in South Carolina. Yeah, that that would have been a weird place to be, right? I mean it made sense for his job. Yeah. Okay. Yes. But he was born in New Jersey. Right. He had grown up going to an Episcopal school on Long Island with all white people. Yeah. And his professional life had been entirely in New York City and Boston. So he, and he had been free his entire life. Yeah. And did not, this was actually, he had never in his life before that interacted with anyone besides Frederick Douglass. Uh Uh-huh. Who had been enslaved at any point in their lives. Oh, wow. Uh Uh-huh. So he goes down there and he thinks he knows what's needed. Mm. And he discovers very quickly that he, in fact, does not know Mm -hmm. what is needed and him being the awesome individual that he is, was, he sat down and talked to those newly freed people and asked them what they needed. You know, it's as simple as, it's, I hate to say that it's it's simple, but sometimes just talking with people, it's really the best way to go. And listening. I mean, this is. It's an art. It's an art form. This predates Saul Alinsky. Yeah. But this is the, sorry, not Saul Alinsky, what I'm talking about. It's Friere. This predates yep. him. Yeah. But this is this is Freire's thing. I just said yes to both because they both sounded right <laughs> to me, which is not a, it's not, this is not a history I'm too or, I'm too well versed when although Ben is I think trying the to reason, teach me. <laughs> the reason I know anything about them is because Ben gave me reading lists. <laughs> he gave me some reading today too. <laughs> There's one book, I don't know if you've been recommended it yet, uh-huh. that you have to get a specific edition of it. There's there's a number of books like that. Like Dialectic he, of Enlightenment, you have to get a specific edition of it. If you get the I think it's the orange one, you have to get the orange one. 
do not get the gray dialectic of light and But we are going to fact check this because I don't because I do not want to put out the wrong yeah, I information think, here. It might be the other way around. It might be the gray one. I think the one that he was like very concerned about for me was revelry for radicals. <laughs> And it was like, it had to be the first edition. You have to get the right edition. Well, Otherwise, and to be fair, just... he like wrote about how the later editions messed up the theory so much mm-hmm. in his like PhD thesis. Yeah. So yeah. Like, this is something he cares about. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I, I fully trust you f- fully full trust to Ben on what editions and what translations are the right ones when it comes to organizing history and theater and yeah. a bunch of other subjects. So yeah. I didn't realize when I picked this topic that this would be so much in that wheelhouse. In fact, cool. I do not remember where I got this book. I was thinking, who am I going to do next? And I saw this book, and I have literally zero memory of how it came into my possession. Cool. Well, so, tell me tell me what happens next. Yeah. So he sits down and he listens. And what he finds out is that the people who, have, who are newly freed, they'd experience violence, of course, at the hands of people people in the south Mm -hmm. but they'd also experienced violence at the hands of northern opportunists and union soldiers Mm -hmm. so these people were just fully done with white people yeah the uh quote that i pulled out that was a quote that he had written down from a survivor was that the victims would be glad if all the white people would go away and let them live by themselves Mm. which honestly i i get it definitely get that but this was something that he had to learn because he had right. been living in white society yeah. for his entire life. Yeah. So I'm he- very interested. I do not know much about how white Northerners took advantage of, of newly freed people at the time. Um, that's something I would like to learn more about. Yeah, my knowledge of it is is pretty, like, broad because mm-hmm. I know that the Union soldiers would just come in and mess stuff up. Yeah. And like, the Union soldiers, man, they were, you know, they were on the right side, but um, they were sometimes dicks. Yeah. Some yeah. of them were jerks. Some of them were jerks. Yeah. So the <laughs> <laughs> I know that because I watched Cold Mountain. Yeah. <laughs> they were... I love that movie. <laughs> I, I watched Cold Mountain and that's how I know. That's all. It's the only reason I know. Great movie. Great. Best soundtrack. Best soundtrack. Very good. Very good acting. Excellent acting. Um, I've, I have not watched it in since I was... It has I Shape was, Note in it. Yes, it has great Shape Note in it. I have not watched it since I was in sixth grade. So I don't remember. But it's... Uh, we love Cold Mountain here. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So the, the victims of enslavement were saying, like, we just want to be left alone mm-hmm. at this point. Really checks out. 1865 rolls around and William Tecumseh Sherman who does not have a great record with his interaction with the newly freed people the man himself, himself. Uh, but William Tecumseh Sherman enacted special field order number 15 that provided for the settlement of formerly enslaved people especially those following the army because there were a lot of them that just followed the Union Army because they had nowhere to go and if they followed the Union Army they wouldn't get captured got it and so he took he he made an exclusive reservation made up of the islands this quote the islands from Charleston south the abandoned rice fields along the rivers from 30 miles back from the sea and the country okay so this area was where the wealthiest plantations were before the war okay rice plantations like they, people talk about king cotton right before king cotton there was king rice and King Indigo. Yes. <laughs> Everyone forgets about the Indigo. But I just want to say, and team, and King Indigo, and the place to go to learn about that is Oak and Acorn Denim. They have done an entire history about the Indigo and how, where jeans come from. Just jeans in general. I just want to throw that in there because that story is not well told. Anyway. Jeans are an interesting story. Jeans are a ridiculously interesting story because they are so, it's such an example of something that's to- so totally reclaimed later in, in, in a reclaimed and remade into something entirely different. Yeah. Later in the world. But it's, it's fat, just material history. You yeah, never know so, where it will go. Yeah. So special field order number 15 
Sherman, part of why he did this was because he was tired of these people following the army. They were slowing the army down. And Sherman was not the nicest man. No. So this was the better way he dealt with this this issue. So this is the area all the old rice plantations becomes a reservation and special order number 15 said that white people, excluding military personnel, could not live on the islands. Mm -hmm. Blacks were given the sole and exclusive management of affairs. Okay. And settlers could claim a homestead of up to 40 acres and receive uh, promissory titles issued by the inspector of settlements and plantations, who Mm -hmm. is that Rufus Saxton guy I mentioned earlier. Okay. Two months after that, Congress established the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands. And Saxton was the, was in charge of that for South Carolina and Georgia and appointed Campbell as superintendent for the islands in Georgia. So this is a lot of bureaucracy for this is how Campbell had the power that he did to do what he did. Got it. And is he in charge of all of this? He's in charge. So Campbell is in charge of the islands off of the coast of Georgia. Interesting. Which are these, like, former rice plantations Got and it. stuff. Got it. Okay. So Campbell gets to it. He starts writing to organizations in the north for assistance with food and clothing to get the what was called Sea Island Colony off the ground. hmm And he we, – we don't know if he actually intended for it to forever be a separate colony. Yeah. From the rest of the United States because, of course, early on we know he was really into integration. Like, he wanted – white people and black people to be truly equal for sure and in in ways that that we still haven't achieved right but he was listening to what people were saying Mm -hmm. about being really uncomfortable around Mm -hmm. white people Mm -hmm. and so we don't know what his end game was because he didn't have a chance to get there yeah but it was separate to start with anyway and he thought that the most important thing is he needed to that People needed to be taught how to engage as free citizens of the United States. Mm -hmm. Because there's all these things we learn as citizens of the United States that they were never taught. Like, what is voting? Yeah. What are you voting for? Yeah. How does the judiciary work? Yeah. These really nuts and bolts things. Yeah. And so he formed a government in the Sea Isle Island colony that was based around the United States Constitution. Uh Uh-huh. He formed a 275-person militia. Whoa. Which is... Some white people are not happy about that. It's Uh going to come up. (laughs) (laughs) That makes... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And he founded schools and got donations from the North to support them to teach the democratic process. Okay. The main goal was for the islands to be self-sufficient. Cool. So it encouraged encouraging the people to work for themselves and not accept wage work from white people. Uh Uh-huh. 1866, this gets a little messed up. Okay. Because Andrew Johnson, President Andrew Johnson, (sighs) ruiner of anything good. Every party and every single thing. (laughs) Everything that was possibly good that was happening after the American Civil War Uh, gives all the planters pardons. uh Uh-huh. Which means that they regain ownership of their former plantations, which means all those people oh, no. who up to this point have been working the soil and creating a community mm-hmm. are evicted <gasps> and not given anywhere else to go. Oh, my God. Why does he ruin every? Why does he ruin everything? He did that a lot, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Yeah. So Campbell really believed in what he was doing, though. Mm -hmm. And he thought that this was really the key to making people not just legally free, but actually free to live their lives and be truly free. Yeah. And so he used his own money for a down payment on 1,250 acres at the Belleville in McIntosh County, Georgia. Am I saying that right? Macintosh? How do I... Okay, Macintosh. I just looked over... My my wife is here, and she is from Georgia. (laughs) So it's like, Georgia thing. Georgia. Macintosh County, Georgia. He then was put in the position of having to get these mortgage payments covered, but also still teaching the things he wanted to teach. Mm -hmm. 
So there's this like stress between cash crops and subsistence farming. Mm. What he wanted was for people just to do subsistence farming. Yeah. But they needed to pay off this mortgage. Yeah. So that balance between the two was really hard to achieve. Uh Uh-huh. What made it especially hard is that that it was just a bad crop year for everyone. Like, it was just a bad year. And, (sighs) of course, this was seen by a lot of racist white people as proof that black people couldn't manage their own properties. Yeah. Never mind that all the white people's farms also did really badly. So it's just, it's a bad year. It's a bad year for farms. Yeah, just not a good year. It was not a good year to be starting a new farm. And tensions are rising, I'm sure. Oh, right. sure. Yeah, yeah. But it's 1867, so even though Andrew Johnson is the worst, the Radical Republicans control Congress. We might remember the Radical Republicans from the last episode. Yeah. Uh, and they, t- they brought the South under martial law. Okay. And ordered all eligible voters to be registered. Got it. And Campbell was on it. Yep. Uh, he was... Doing that in McIntosh, Liberty, and Tattnall okay. counties. Okay. Get I just everybody. got I just got a shrug from Mazal on Tattnall, so we're going for it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. There was a group of three registrars. Two of them were white, and one of them was black. And he managed to register a whole slew of people. So in McIntosh County, he registered 675 black people and 120 white people. And he saw this voter differential and said, there's power here, Mm -hmm. which is what a good organizer does. Yeah. And he said, you know, if I want to use this power, these people need education. Mm -hmm. I I can't just educate the people on this little, like, farmland thing, this little commune he had going. Yeah. He needs to educate everybody. And so he started traveling around and educating people on how to vote and why it was important. And he combined it with religious sermons. Huh. Which got people coming out. Ooh. And also created this this feeling of it's not just your civic duty, but your religious duty. Interesting. To participate in democracy. <gasps> Whoa. I think part of that was he was just a religious guy. Sure. Uh, I don't I don't know that that was something he was specifically thinking about. But, I mean, not the first time that civil rights and religion would uh, go hand in hand. Nor the last time. Nor the last yeah, so you know that much. He was also sent to the like I said, this guy did so much stuff. Like I'm having such a hard yeah. time telling this story because he just did so many things. He was a productive and, man, and he it's usually was it's usually easy for me to go in and say, well, okay, this thing isn't important, and this thing doesn't serve the story, right? But I had there was so little I could cut out from this man's life. Yes. <laughs> um, so he was part of the Georgia Constitutional Convention for developing a new state constitution. This is something that I hadn't thought about in a while because I hadn't thought about Reconstruction in a while. Mm -hmm, But mm -hmm. this was part of Reconstruction, was bringing the southern states back into the Union. And part of that was these really basic things like rewriting the Constitution. Mm -hmm. He was voted to go there because the white people in his region withheld their ballots. They did Uh that thing where they're like, we're mad, so we're not going to participate. (laughs) Uh, Well... So it's just like such a weird, that's that, I don't know. It doesn't seem like a very effective strategy. No, it isn't. And they figured that out later. But, <laughs> but at that moment, oh, there are not. consequences to doing that. Like, oh, wait. I mean, I'd love for them to do that every time. Yes, you know. Um, <laughs> so there were, there were, we, we're both like, I think we both had days where our just brains are just fully fried. I <laughs> have been doing, a, I have done a lot today. And I don't, I did get a coffee canceled, a coffee date that was canceled, but I don't know how I would have done today without that, with that coffee date. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That would have been too much. (laughs) And, uh, but now we're, now we're here and I feel, I feel okay, but definitely fried. Yeah. This is a long week. This is a long week. Same. And it's, it's, it's Tuesday. No! (laughs) No! (laughs) It's only Tuesday! No, I am hyped for Shabbos this week because it's just gonna be a long struggle (laughs) yeah this week's a a lot for me too yeah (laughs) okay so he is voted to the Georgia Constitutional Convention and he is one of 37 black people who's been voted to the 170 delegate yeah uh, convention cool 
And he was a prominent member of the convention because he actually attended all the meetings. Good going. Which sounds like it should be the, the basic. Yeah. But it's not. Yeah. Still today in politics. Like, politicians not, are not in Congress that often. Man, I, uh, it's kind of crazy because a lot of people just don't go to meetings, including our politicians. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's, that's fucked up. Anyway. But unless people really want power and he did so yeah he went to every single meeting nice and he was seen as the level-headed radical Got so it. the moderates looked at him as somebody who they could negotiate with uh-huh uh-huh which is a good way to be you know yeah but this is where his naivete comes out again mm-hmm. and i i wonder if there's an element of when he was with these people that he was meeting in georgia and south carolina he was learning and changing his opinions but back in a predominantly white space if he, like, kind of went back to some of his old habits because he thought that discrimination could be legislated away. Interesting, yeah. So I he, mean, yeah. It, legislation helps. Yes, it is. Yes, it helps, but also... This is, this is the opposite of what I should be saying as an anarchist, but, but sometimes it's needed. But it's the stress between the, the world as yeah. it ought to be and the world as it is. Yeah, yeah. And so organizing he, is the best, but sometimes we do need a couple of good handy civil rights laws in there. Yes. Yeah. So some so for example, he voted against a clause that would allow black men the right to hold office. Hmm. Because he thought that to end discrimination there needed to be colorblindness in the law. Hmm. This is going to bite him later yeah this is gonna this is gonna come back yeah okay i this is this sounds like a little bit of that stuff he was doing early on yeah that's why i have to wonder because (laughs) this is after he spent time in georgia and south carolina so i have to wonder if just being in that predominantly white space again yeah because i know for me if i'm in a space that is predominantly like upper middle class I behave in a way that is different than the mm. space that's predominantly working class mm, interesting and I it's something that I'm aware of so now I if I make that change it is purposeful uh-huh. but there's definitely this like I grew up in a wealthy suburb of Philadelphia and that's what for a long time I would fall back on so yeah. I have to wonder if that was part of it it's interesting, too, though, because it's like, did it change his political beliefs, like, going back to that world? Because, like, I could see myself, like, you know, I act in diff- different ways in different group settings. But I, like, it's interesting. I wonder if it, like, impact like, being around all those guys and kind of losing the connection with people, like, on the ground. If that just kind of, if he kind of, like, just became unmoored a little bit. Yeah, from or his per- from his direction, maybe and and or he. I'm waiting for that motorcycle to go by. Vroom, vroom. <laughs> vroom. All right, gotta love Broad vroom, Street. Vroom. <laughs> Broad Street, baby. Probably we should probably next time record in the different part of this apartment. That would actually be really spooky. <laughs> because this has good space, but um, it's probably the worst place we could be actually. I'm so sorry. It's okay. I, I didn't think about that until I did no, not I, think of that as an option until now. It's just I, I think it's funny because I'm doing all this stuff like, well, why don't you sit over here? And you sit over here, and it's like <laughs> just like motorcycles going by in the background. Uh, I, I'm, I'm like arra- rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, if you live on Broad Street, that's kind of what this is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. When I record the, the, the like, intro-outro stuff, mm-hmm. it's always... Which reminds me, I forgot to put the intro. I didn't say any of the intro. Oh, my God. I'll add it later. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'll do it at home. Uh, I'm always like, wow, it's really quiet. <laughs> oh, gosh. All right. So let's let's redo our location next next time. Yes. we Lessons learned. Yeah. It's, so you guys are our day ones. The people that are listening to the first episodes ever with the sound we have currently. Maybe ne- next time around, your listening experience will be better, but it'll be less vintage. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we've got that that warmth. Yeah, yeah. Of background noise. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so anyway, back to Joseph Campbell. 
<laughs> he, uh, da, 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 da. so he, in the end, was part of passing Georgia's most radical constitution ever. And when I say ever, I mean ever. Okay. Like before and since. Interesting. It ended imprisonment for debt. It gave okay. suffrage to all black men. Okay. Oh, actually, I just wrote black men. That's probably... No, it was all black men. Okay. Um, and provided a public school system for both races. All right. So you have to remember, at this point, there wasn't a public school system for white people either. Oh, wow. Like, a lot of places had, you know, your one-room schoolhouse. Like, your... If you think, like, your Laura Ingalls Wilder yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. But it wasn't, like, a public school system. And... So was it? A, it was a separate, two separate school systems. Oh yeah, uh-huh. no, it was a, it was not integrated. Got it. But nonetheless, this was very radical for the yeah. time and now. Yeah, I mean the whole imprisonment for debt thing. That is, yeah, damn. So he was voted one of three black people on the first Georgia Senate under the new constitution, and that was with the white people not withholding their ballots. All right. But nonetheless, the Democrats were beaten more than two to one because there were just a lot more black people. Right. And conservatives in the Georgia Senate were upset that any black people were in the Senate, Mm -hmm. even though there were only three of them. Uh Uh-huh. And so in response to that, Senator Milton A. Chan... Nope, that's not how you say his name. Senator Milton A. Candler... Chandler. Chandler. Not Chandler from No, I really wanted to be Chandler, but there's no H. Oh, so sad. Unsuccessfully entered a resolution against all three black senators, arguing that the Constitution did not grant blacks the privilege of office holding. Okay. Mm. So they're... They're going, they're going strong right out the gate. Okay. Oof. This was unsuccessful, but then they started ganging up on one of the other black senators named A.A. A. Bradley. A.A. A. Bradley was a hothead. He actually got chucked out of the Constitutional Convention for using abusive language against white people. And they went after him because he was the easiest target. Yeah. And so they investigated him for a crime of quote-unquote seduction in New York. Uh, okay. And seduction. Campbell, Campbell actually sat on that on that committee probably just to make sure he got you know, a fair shake. Yeah. And conservatives use this as an excuse to get rid of Bradley because uh-huh. he was black. Campbell filibustered it, though. He filibustered for three full days. Wow. Whoa. Yeah, because, and also, like, New York was like, this seduction isn't against the law in what, New York. What is seduction? Like, seducing somebody? I think so. <laughs> I think it was. You could be charged with seducing? Well, you couldn't. It wasn't, it was, I think it was against the law in Georgia. Okay. But it wasn't against law in New York. Huh. And so that I've was... I've never heard that as a legal term. Same. Ad- <laughs> That's bizarre. Which is why I'm so like, I think. Who was seducing who? I think he was seducing young ladies. Okay. I guess. But were they too young? I don't... I don't know. Okay. I was going to say I don't think so, but like, who knows? Okay. <laughs> It's no, the 19th century. No, wait, anything's it's, possible. I'm so sorry. <laughs> who was who was being charged with seduction? A A A Bradley. A A Bradley. Who is another black senator who is got it. A radical and a hothead. So it's it's kind of this is a bullshit charge. Yes, I, I assume. Okay. Yes. Got it. Very much so. Got it. Which is why, even though I didn't get the feeling that Campbell was like BFFs. Yeah. With Bradley, he still filibustered for three days because it was nonsense. But unfortunately, a month later, Campbell lost his job, too, because the Georgia General Assembly voted 24 to 11 that black people did not have the right to hold office. Hmm. They did, however, allow Campbell to file an official protest. Okay. In the record. Okay. So that's something. Yeah. (laughs) It's something. Yes. It's like, it's like your, it's like your little, like, the, you tried stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he isn't going to take this line down because he's Tennis Campbell and he gets right. things done. Yes, he does. So he goes to Washington, D.C. to protest this. And he tries to, this is, this is so, I love this. Mm-hmm. He's such an icon. Mm-hmm. He goes up to Washington, D.C. and he protests the Georgia senators, like the United States senators. Yeah. From being seated because they had engaged in in sedition 
Yeah, yeah, because okay. they had been supporters of the of the Confederacy, and right. this was a thing actually, very much so that you weren't allowed to hold office if you had participated in the Confederacy. But very conveniently, a lot of those politicians received pardons, right, from President Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson, that our jerk, asshole. Somebody should impeach him. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, he, he was in peace. So he goes up, protests these Georgia senators from taking their seats, and he also started the conversation that would result in the 15th Amendment, which is the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Okay. And this really shows how much he's learned at this point. Yeah. That you actually do need to mention race, because if not, people are going to take advantage of that. Yes. yes. He then moves to Darien, Georgia, where he had been voted Justice of the Peace. And Darien was an interesting place. Its, its demographics were changing quite a bit. It was becoming a predominantly black town when it had previously been predominantly white. Mm-hmm. And part of the reason that happened was because after the American Civil War, there was no currency in the mm-hmm. South. Mm-hmm. The Confederate dollar had fully collapsed and when I say collapsed I mean like it was several hundred dollars to get like a pound of sugar or flour damn and when I say like several hundred dollars I don't mean like today's money yeah I mean back then money yeah so there was no the confederate dollar was just a disaster and then right. all of these planters in order to show their their support of the confederate movement had put all of their wealth in confederate dollars okay so they Oof. just there just wasn't money and so how the market worked was mostly through, through bartering and, interesting and in that way in darien and other places a lot of black people got land because all that white people had was land yeah and black people had skills that were needed yeah by the white people yeah so this was happening in Darien, which is how he ended up being, Campbell ended up Justice of Peace. And he saw this as an opportunity to really show how things ought to be run. So one thing that he was still harping on was the importance of land ownership. Mm-hmm. A lot of black people were in a situation where they had to decide between sharecropping and labor gangs. Yeah, And we tend to think about sharecropping in this really negative light today Mm -hmm. because it was negative there were a lot of issues with sharecropping there was nothing to stop the owner from just lying about how much money had been earned by that plot of land yeah and keeping people perpetually in debt yeah however when you were a sharecropper you decided what your days looked like Mm -hmm. when you were on a labor gang you did not Mm -hmm. and that was really valuable to especially formerly enslaved people yeah so he was really pushing people to avoid working for wages because in his mind, it wasn't that much better. Got it. <laughs> he used his power of justice of the peace to arrest abusive employers. Mm. And he went around the county teaching black people about their labor rights. Cool. Yeah. He's really like just yeah. always doing, he's always doing the most in the best yeah. possible way. Yeah. And he kept doing as much as he could at the state level. In 1870, black senators were given their seats back. He protested the Democratic senators who had lied on their oaths to take their seats Mm. as far as their participation in the Confederacy. Yeah. And he was successful to keep seven, keeping seven of them away from their seats. All right. Yeah. So he, he, he was successful. Around this time, though, he's doing all this, doing a lot of amazing stuff. Like I said, he he would, he would, if a ship came through, a boat came through, they did a lot of timber trade, so Mm -hmm. there was a lot of, like, on water trade. And if he found out a boat captain was treating his employees poorly, he would just arrest him. Nice. (laughs) And this got (laughs) people pretty mad. Yeah. And uh, those people had a name and those were redeemers okay so redeemers were the conservatives Hmm. and they wanted to kill reconstruction in the south Mm -hmm. they did everything they could 
to strip Campbell of any power he had. Yeah. So after he got his Senate seat back, they threw away the votes from two counties due to quote unquote voter fraud. Huh. The voter fraud, by the way, was maybe one of the polls had stayed open a little longer than it should have. They're always doing this with the voter fraud. Yeah, this is this is not we're still doing this. We're still doing still this fighting now. This yep. Fight. yep. So they started to use the people that he had arrested as justice of the peace to try to get him removed from that position. Interesting. Okay. So, yeah. So at one point, a white man named Fisher reported that two black men had burglarized his bakery. Campbell set, sent out his deputies and they couldn't find the perpetrators, but they did find the stolen property that they returned to Fisher. And then Fisher was presented with a $73 bill for services rendered and got very upset, was cursing Campbell out, and was imprisoned for contempt of court for five hours. Mm. There was also another case where he fined a white man named Isaac Raff who burglarized two homes. He gave him a fine of $100 in an order to keep the peace for six months. Raff never paid and... He never served his jail sentence. He skipped town. Okay. So the Redeemers found these cases and were like, we got this. We can we can get Campbell thrown in prison over this. Oh, damn. Okay. Which is ridiculous because he didn't do anything illegal, but yeah. Yeah. So they get this guy, Judge Henry B. Tompkins, who just decides that it's his personal mission to get Campbell in prison. Wow. He refused to set bail or set the bail outrageously high. He issued bench warrants, and they just went after him again and again and again. For and what both were they trying cases. to get him on exactly? For imprisoning white people for insufficient insufficient cause. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Yeah. And also, they were having a hard time forcing him to do the bench warrants because. The black townspeople, he had organized them into a militia. Mm -hmm. And so when people were trying to, like, take him away, the militia would fight back. And Campbell wasn't asking for this. They were just like, no, like, you're not taking him. He was given bail of $3,000 and he couldn't make it. So he was brought, brought to prison, although lots of these militia folks were... Uh, kind of staring down the folks and taking him away, which they deserved. And it went through just appeal after appeal after appeal. And we have this, this we have this rule in the United States against double jeopardy, which is this idea of you, you can't be tried for the same crime twice. Uh huh. But yeah. they just kept doing that. Yeah, <laughs> they yeah. kept doing it, and they just did it until again and it again. stuck. In fact, it was so bad that a conservative Democratic judge said that Judge Tompkins was shamefully persecuting Campbell. Okay. So, like, this guy who was, like, definitely racist, definitely, like, definitely against Reconstruction was like, this is too much. Damn. Damn. So, so it's gotten, it's gotten extreme. And we have a siren here. Just, you know, just that good, good. This is a Philadelphia podcast. Yes. Brought to you from the city of Philadelphia. Brotherly love and sisterly affection. Oh, is um, that? Did we? Who came up with that? Uh, well, but brotherly love is what Philadelphia means in Greek. So oh. William Penn came up with that. Okay. And sisterly affection came from an advertisement for a lesbian bar in oh. like the 19th century or something. Yeah. But it was added on in the 90s to make it more quote unquote PC. But I love that it came from a lesbian bar. That's great. <laughs> I love that. So, yeah. Okay. So, Campbell realizes that there is no way he is going to get a proper, like, like a fair trial in the state of Georgia. So, he tried to get the case transferred to federal court, but time ran out. Whoever was supposed to file the thing didn't file it in time or whatever. So the Georgia Supreme Court eventually threw out the case and Campbell was sent to the state penitentiary and then put on a chain gang under Georgia's convict lease law. Oh, my goodness. He was 63 years old. (gasps) What? Yeah. 
Yeah. Are you shitting me right now? I am not shitting you right now. I forgot if we can cuss or not. You can cut. You cut this out. It, it's it's fine. We already had cursing. I, I told okay. Nicole I think I've given up on the no cursing. <laughs> <laughs> so was, was it my fault again? Yes, but it's okay. Oh my gosh! <laughs> no, I'm so sorry. Oh my god, it's okay. All I right. think I'm more used to having to like edit myself. <laughs> if you can. Oh my gosh. All right. Well, my it's apologies. Fine. It's fine. It, it, oh, these are wow. appropriate moments to curse because it is. It yeah. is bullshit. Yeah, it is. It is bullshit. <laughs> This is that is a bullshit thing in in general. Oh my goodness! And ah! he did what he could to get good treatment. He was very charming, yeah. And so he got good treatment from the overseer, but the overseer was not a good guy. Like he, yeah. Under that in that same time period, several black people died from whippings <sighs> under that overseer's watch. Yeah. So, yeah. Campbell was really just surviving any way he could. Yeah. yeah. When he was released, he left the state was just done done with Georgia. Yeah. And so he went to Washington DC to speak on behalf of the black people of Georgia. Mhm. And he he did however give a farewell speech to the Macintosh black citizens December 30th, 1882. And then he died in 1891 in Boston and we're not really sure what happened between those dates. He really fell off the map. Huh. In 1907 so about, I can do math, 16 years after he died, the Georgia General Assembly officially disenfranchised black people. Oh, wow. So black people could no longer vote in the state of Georgia. Wow. This happening so late, like 1907, that is a long time after the American Civil War. Yeah. And this is where Tunis Campbell is really important. Mm-hmm. Because Reconstruction was unfortunately a failed project in the United States. Mm-hmm. And there were a lot of really good people doing really good things. Mm -hmm. But the redeemers, quote unquote, were just too powerful. And they were able to kill Reconstruction. Yeah. Campbell, because of his work in Darien, kept Reconstruction alive in parts of Georgia far later than anywhere else in the United States. Wow. So Reconstruction basically didn't exist anywhere except in this Macintosh County, Georgia. Wow. Due to Tunis Campbell. And also because of this, he's gone down in history as an opportunist carpetbagger. <laughs> and I know growing up, huh. I remember being told about the carpetbaggers coming down and just taking advantage. Mm. And that's not what was going on here at all. Yeah. But that's the story that has existed because, you know, racism. Yeah. But I think there's a lot we can learn about Tunis Campbell. That I think Tunis Campbell is somebody we should talk about more because yeah. he did a lot of the things that I think we need today. Yeah. I mean, listening to disenfranchised people mm-hmm. is huge, mm-hmm. but not to the exclusion of the things that you know. Right. Like, you can have both. You can, right. you can know, like, academic stuff. Yeah. And also learn not academic stuff about from people on the ground. Yeah. I mean, he needed both those skills to do yeah. all the things he did. Uh-huh. And to this sounds really bad but to make sure everything's in writing <laughs> um because yeah he really trusted people at various points yeah. to do the right thing and yeah. they didn't yeah and so i know you're you're an anarchist so this goes against your <laughs> your uh general feelings uh-huh. but uh sometimes we need to have laws and stuff we do need to have laws and stuff. I am an I am an anarchist that thinks that in our current society we yes. need to have laws and stuff. Right. And it's <laughs> this is the thing of of whenever somebody might say to you like, "Okay, I mean, sure, I think that insert progressive idea here. Yeah. Gay marriage, w- better policing, whatever. Uh-huh. But why do we need to legislate it? Yeah. I don't know if the listeners have had this happen. I've had people say this to me before. Like, we don't need to legislate all this stuff. Yeah. 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 There's a reason. There is a reason to legislate stuff. And And the reason is what happened to Tunis Campbell. And there's reasons to, uh, there's a reason to vote. There's a reason to vote. I am a voting, a very proudly voting anarchist. And I get very frustrated with people that don't vote. Yeah, in the my, power yeah. that Campbell did manage to amass was entirely due 
to voting. Yeah. And it's, it's, it is a very powerful tool when you have that right. When you have that right, you should, you need to use it because especially for when I'm, where, from where I'm coming from, anar- you're actually closer to anarchy if you vote because it means that your voice is more powerful than, than it otherwise would have been. And also the importance of educating voters. Yeah. Because we don't have a great percentage of people who vote yeah. in the United States. Yeah. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Yeah. Also, my the other thing I like to I like to say is if you just find that you are just way too disgusted with both candidates, there's a there's a point where that's understandable. At least vote local. Vote local, local, local. Vote down the ballot. If you cannot vote for the two for the two presidential people, your local votes make such an enormous difference. Most of the things that impact <laughs> you on a day to day basis yeah. are local laws, and local we see laws. this with Campbell too. Yep. Campbell held back the destruction of Reconstruction in his county in Georgia. Yeah. And that may seem like a small thing, but it was not a small thing to the residents of McIntosh County, Georgia. Yeah. It was not a small thing to the people in Darien. Yeah. It is really good for more communist, anarchist, far left people to get out there and put your votes in for your local your local people especially i yes. yeah it's, local people and ballot measures and, and ballot measures take a look at those ballot measures there is a effect happening around you and it would be silly to not take five minutes to have a little say in that effect that's my that's my quick and while we're just to close box. this out yes my last i'm gonna add one last thing to the soapbox pay attention to special elections Pay attention to special elections. and They're easy to miss. They're so easy to miss. And if you feel... Pikachu, if you muzzle the mic, it's not going to turn out well for anybody. Pikachu has been sitting in Issa's lap this entire time. He it's very has cute. Been. It's like extremely cute. He's been very lovely today. Vote in your special elections. And what's the other thing? Um, yeah, take a look at those special ballots. Um, oh my gosh. Was there something else? Vote down the ballot. Vote down the ballot. Down ballot. And, I and love, vote. Vote. Voting is really, it really is, like, yeah, it really on is the, important. On the national level, it, it might be a drop oh. in the bucket, but on the local level, yeah. it is not. It is not. Your vote is very much, it's like hundreds of times larger in the local. You could say it that way. Yeah. You're, if you think you're, if your vote is a drop in the bucket in the national level, which in a lot of, in, in every scenario, yes, it is for sure. We, there's no denying that. Um, Especially with the whole electoral electoral college. college. (laughs) The whole thing where we don't actually have a democracy. Yeah. Um, I hate that part. It's like, I know why it happened. It doesn't make me like it anymore. (laughs) It, it wasn't a good, it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. It's among the ideas that the found, the, the founders, the, the people who wrote the constitution had that made sense in a vacuum. That do not actually make sense. Yeah, and not at I'm this not going to get on that soapbox because no. that's I can go on. For but a while he, we're not going to get into that. <laughs> but and if you need to be motivated more, just read a few essays from like the 1920s about all of the people they'd have going out to like literally attack people who were voting. Yes. Um. So like. 1920s New York. I'm saying 20s, but it's probably earlier than that also. Oh, I mean, here in Philadelphia, just, you know, just north of where we are sitting Mm. is a memorial to Octavius Cato. Yep. Who was assassinated for supporting the black vote in Philadelphia after the American Civil War. A lot of people died to that, that you could vote. And were beaten very severely. Yes. Um, And so I'm thinking about the... The first women that were out there voting, some of them just got really beat up. Yeah. It's a crazy history. And I only, I've been reading my, very slowly, I've been reading it over the past like six months, like a collection of Jewish radical, like primary document essays. And there are a bunch about how like the labor unions were just getting, they just got beat up at the, they'd have like these like huge, scary guys that the bosses would hire to stop anybody the labor union from voting and they would just stand at the polling places and just beat you up and there are people like like a bunch of 
yeah, people that would just like go in to vote no matter what. And then they would tell speeches about it. And people would get mad. And they were like, you can't do that. And then, uh, you know, intimidation still happens. But it's pretty rare to be that violently beat up anymore for voting. Yeah. But there is still, like, in, in Georgia, for example. Yeah. Um, I was really surprised when Mazal told me that waiting for hours and hours to vote is is normal. Yes. There are still huge barriers and that so, is So, like, irritating. I know here in Philadelphia, I had to wait, like, an hour and a half to vote once. Yeah. And that was a unique situation. Georgia is one of the places where there are still barriers for a lot of people. And that fucking sucks. And that... And there's more barriers happening every day. So vote. Yeah. Pay attention. We love you all. We love you all. I'm hungry and want to Me dinner. too. <laughs> too. Alright, we gotta go get some food. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to D-Listers of History. If you enjoyed yourself, be sure to subscribe and drop us a review on whatever platform you listen on. A huge thank you to April Keys for the use of the song Misfit from her album Mountain View. You can find her on all the various social media platforms, Bandcamp, etc. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and decreasingly TikTok at D-Listers of History, no hyphens. A big shout out to the folks supporting us on Patreon, like the glorious Michelle. If you want to support us and get access to all sorts of exclusive content, become a patron of the program. We are about to launch a bunch of like little mini episodes on Patreon, so now is a great time to hop on there. All of this and more can be found on our website, dlistersofhistory.com. Again, no hyphens, just smish it together. And our next episode will be coming out on March 20th, and that will be the last episode of season one. We will be taking a month break and then coming back after that, back on our regular first and third Monday schedule. But in the meantime, if you become a patron, you can get, again, lots of mini episodes, which will be dropping soon. And now for an episode relevant audio drop. Soldiers of the world. Tunis Campbell is the best living creature that it was a leader after reconstruction oh, yeah. in this nation. God bless. Thank you, Queen, for being with us. We appreciate your presence here in this barren land. We know that you are our leader for the purpose of making sure that freedom is the thing that we finally obtained. Yes. I know that our agreement is that Freedom March just started That's right. yesterday. Yes. Now some folk think that what has happened is we're already free. <laughs> we know better. Right. We Gullah Geechee people, anointed Gullah Geechee yes. people, yes. we know we ain't free until the land belongs to we. There we, go. we are asking the God that we serve, yes. through you, Queen, and your leadership, to make sure that we have fishing vessels. Yes. To yes. make sure we have fishermen. Yes. That make sure we have farmers. Yes. We want the harvest to be ours. Yes. We are not about pennies. Right. This wishing well economics got to stop. Right. Give me a dime and I you'll get a quarterback. That ain't good enough for right. us no more. Right. Freedom comes to us from the ownership of the land Man. and from from shipping out from the coast. Yes. into the ocean and bringing fish back here yes. to feed our people. Yes. Yes. God bless you. God bless you. And God Peace bless the land. Thank Peace you. and blessings.